Welcome. This is uh, using silent mitigations, understanding weaknesses within Internet Explorer's isolated heap and memory protection. So this talk originates around a set of research we did in mid 2014 and completed in around February uh, 2015, and it really is an in-depth look at the new mitigations that are being introduced into Internet Explorer. Specifically, we're talking about the isolated heap and memory protection mitigations. Um, we'll be covering not only how these mitigations work, but we'll also be covering uh, how to attack these mitigations. We'll also be talking about how you can use one of these mitigations to break another mitigation, in this case mem using memory protection as a way to bypass ASLR. We'll also cover all of the defenses that we suggested to Microsoft. In fact, this research won $125,000 from Microsoft's mitigation bypass and blue hat bonus for defense bounty program which we in turn donated to STEM uh, charities that support STEM education. And it's also nominated for this year's Pony Award for uh, most innovative research. So we got a lot to cover so we're going to go start diving in. Just a quick overview of who we are. Uh, up here on the stage and several people out here in the front are actually members of the Zero Day Initiative Program uh, celebrating its tenth year as the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. We focus on vulnerability research uh, and, and remediation along with advanced exploitation techniques uh, working to procure those uh, from researchers around the world and working with the vendors to get them fixed. Um, I got to work, uh, my, my name is Brian Gorentz, I actually run the Zero Day Initiative Program uh, and I work again with researchers around the world trying to get bugs fixed and purchasing research off of, off of individuals out there in the world. Um, I also organize the ever popular Pwn to Own Hacking Competition and I got to work with uh, Simon and Abdul here uh, on this research project and I'll have them introduce themselves real quick. I'm Abdul, I'm a security researcher uh, working for the Zero Day Initiative Program been working for ZDI for the past two years. Um, I do cause analysis and bug discovery. Simon. Hi, I'm Simon Zuckerbron. On Twitter, I'm Hex Kitchen. I've been working with uh, ZDI for a little over a year and I've done a lot of work with Internet Explorer. All right. So it should come as no surprise to people in this room that use after free vulnerabilities were, uh, were very, very popular with exploiters out there and you can see on the slide uh, the list of uh, uh, use after free vulnerabilities that were under active exploitation in the years of 2013 and 2014 and really something had to be done about this. They pretty much was every month, every other month, a new use after free vulnerability would come show up in the wild being used in a targeted attack against corporations or being used against uh, governments and so really like we said something had to be done and Microsoft decided to do something about it uh, in, in the middle of 2014 and they introduced uh, a couple new mitigations in there to make exploitation harder. And this really had the result of shifting the attack surf shifting attackers away from Internet Explorer and now that and, and as most of you know they're focusing on flash vulnerabilities uh, to, to break into corporations. So what exactly did they introduce in the middle of 2014 that, that made exploitation harder? Well first was the isolated heap which was introduced in June followed by memory protection in July. And these mitigations were intended to make use after free exploitation harder. And we'll talk about how all of these work and the attacks that we identified that, that work against these mitigations here, here in a second. But when they were introduced really the side effect for us in the Zero Day Initiative Program was it actually made Internet Explorer fun to research again. Right? We had been spending a lot of time doing root cause analysis on use after free vulnerabilities and other vulnerabilities that existed in that product and it pretty much every time one came in it almost guaranteed was going to work and result in direct code execution. Um, so it really made it fun again which was kind of nice. Here on this slide you can kind of see the vulnerability uh, trends that we had in our program, uh, the submission trends over the, over the last several years and you can see increasingly more and more Internet Explorer vulnerabilities coming into our program and then all of a sudden in 2014 we had a, a significant spike with, with a max of 44 vulnerabilities in Internet Explorer in one month and now that's a lot of work to actually go vet all of those vulnerabilities and make sure that they're valid. But yeah, it really kind of stayed up there for several months, you know, 40, 40 plus zero days in Internet Explorer coming into our program. 
And so, you know, when, when Microsoft introduced the, um, the mitigations that we're going to talk about, it really, for myself, as the one who runs the budget for the program, I kind of thank Microsoft for saving me a bunch of money. Um, and so you can see the, the drop in submissions that happened uh, in the middle of 2014. We're averaging around 25 new zero days in IE uh, every month now. And so what we're going to go through is start looking at the isolated heap and uh, Abdul will go over how it works and the attacks that you can use against it. All right. So isolated heap was introduced in June 2014. We noticed back then that there's a separate heap region created with a heap create API. And the, the main purpose for this uh, region was to uh, provide some kind of isolation between DOM allocations and other types of allocations. Um, so, so basically this was um, a game changer for the use after free exploitation um, because the classical ways of overriding the free objects with um, strings and, and other types of allocations still reside on uh, inside the process heap rather than the isolated. So it provided some kind of isolation which, which, which was pretty cool. Um, so just like any other mit mitigation, um, iso isolated heap contain contains some weaknesses. Um, so basically it has a type confusion issue uh, solely because it, it doesn't keep track of the objects being allocated, the type of objects being allocated and the sizes. So an attacker can, can basically just overwrite an isolated object with another um, isolated object of whatever type he chooses. Um, he, can, he can just allocate anything um, of different sizes, any object of different sizes. Um, attacking isolated heap and exploitation of isolated heap is highly dependent on, on the bug itself. Um, specifically on the offsets that are being dereferenced um, from the field object. So um, the first attack technique that I'll be covering is uh, the aligned allocations attack technique. Um, so, so basically it's uh, simply it's just uh, allocating an object right at the same exact address of, uh, of the field object. Um, so this attack technique is, is, uh, is very useful when you have a user after free condition where the bug is dereferencing high offset. Um, so the only challenge here is just to choose something uh, to replace the feed object with, but something that contains specific values at high offsets that the attacker can control directly or indirectly via spray or anything like that. Um, in order to have a successful aligned attack um, allocation technique, um, one like an attacker can should should avoid uh, the low fragmentation heap. Uh, so the, the, the reason for that is that we're probably going to be allocating objects of different sizes, so, so we, we don't we don't want to want to end up allocating on a different bucket. Um, so the simplest way to achieve this is basically uh, step one is to uh, to trigger the freeing condition. Then we probably have to massage the heap in a way um, to trigger multiple heaps, uh, multiple frees. Sorry. Then uh, we have to coalesce all these free chunks together in one uh, chunk. And later on, we have to spray uh, objects inside that specific free chunk that, free chunk that we generated. And finally, we have to trigger the use um, using the type com confused object. So uh, in this graph, I have the, the C table row object, and up front, we have the C DOM text node. Both are, are isolated. In this specific example, we uh, we're freeing the C table row, and uh, we're overriding it with C on text node, which is smaller in size. Uh, basically, in this specific example, we like we chose the C on text node because at a specific offset, it contains a value that we can uh, potentially control or partially control. So in this uh, wind debug dump, um, it's just like there's a before and after shot. Basically. Before you guys can see the C table row uh, object, and after you guys can see that it, it has been overwritten by C DOM text node. Highlighted in yellow is the offset that we're targeting. Uh, it's offset 30. And basically, the, the C DOM text node contains the value 40000 at that specific offset. And uh, at that, that, that specific value can be sprayed, and the attacker can have some partial control via spray or anything like that. So this is at crash time. If um, if everything everything was successful, we're gonna have um, we're gonna have the bug dereferencing that specific value, and then the attacker can spray that value and go from there and control the flow. So um, the next attack technique that I'll be discussing is the misaligned allocations attack technique. 
basically the aligned allocations that tech technique works really well when we have a high offset. Um, but if, if we have a bug that dereferences a low offset, that, that can be kind of problematic from an attacker's perspective. Uh, specifically because it's really hard to find an object with a low um, offset that we can, uh, that, that has values that we can control at, at its low offsets. Um, so in order to have to, or to solve this problem, um, we have, we have to probably allocate something in a misaligned way. Basically if the original object is aligned at, at address X, then we probably have to start our allocations at X minus N uh, in order to have some object misaligned against the original one. So the simple steps are, um, we, we have to trigger uh, multiple, uh, we have to coalesce multiple uh, free chunks together in order to produce a, a big one. Next, we have to spray this big free chunk uh, with random objects. And later on, we have to, uh, to trigger their use in order to dereference uh, a specific value from the misaligned object that we sprayed with. So again, this is my fancy diagram. Um, it's again, the C we're targeting the C table row object. And as you guys can see up front, like, uh, we have a big, a big chunk and we spray the C button objects inside it. Um, basically we have one C button object that's kind of misaligned against the original one and then we're going to have a dereference from that C but misaligned C button object. So in order to have um, a successful attack, misaligned allocations attack, we have to stabilize the heap in a way to produce the same free chunk, the same one over and over with the same size. Basically this is the code that we've used in this specific um, example. It's not a generic way of doing it but um, this specific code was, was good enough to, uh, to produce the same exact free chunk again and again, which is of size 110. So uh, this is the wind debug uh, dump that shows um, that EDI uh, points to the middle of a free chunk. The free chunk is always of 110 um, hags of size. So assuming we're able to stabilize the heap in a way to produce the same free chunk over and over, then we have to spray this big free chunk with random objects. Basically we chose uh, the button. We were, we were targeting this to override it with a, with a button object. We sprayed the track uh, objects just to, uh, to, uh, to clear up, just to, to cover some holes. And then this worked well. Basically this can be done in multiple ways. Um, some, some, some guys actually did it with a text area. Uh, you can do it with an anchor. It depends whatever you guys want. But the button one works in this example. All right, so this is a crash time. Um, a crash time we had, we had EDI plus one C pointing to an offset from the misaligned C button. Basically this, uh, this offset contains the value one two C zero zero four zero zero and that value can be sprayed by an attacker and then uh, he can control the flow from there. So uh, to recap all this, um, isolated heap does a good job isolating uh, DOM allocations against other type of allocations. It's not perfect, it still contains some weaknesses like type confusion issues. Um, attacking or exploiting isolated heap depends on several factors like the nature of the bug, offsets and low fragmentation heap. So now I'm going to turn it to Brian so he can discuss the memory protection stuff. All right. So we'll go over memory protection. And to go over memory protection, we really have to look back to around July of 2014 when, when they first released memory protection. And inside of the zero day initiative program, we had purchased a bunch of use after free vulnerabilities uh, that it, in, on one day they worked resulting in direct arbitrary code execution and then the next day when the patch was applied, they all turned to null pointer dereferences, right? So this was kind of concerning to us. We were interested in how this, how this worked. Um, and so we started taking a deeper look and we noticed that, that Microsoft had implemented memory protection. So what exactly is memory protection? Well, memory protection is a delayed freeing mechanism that prevents blocks from being deallocated while they're being referenced on the stack. It keeps these blocks in a unusable but allocated condition and adds them to a wait list. And every so often, a reclamation process will occur which will traverse the wait list and see if the blocks have reference, if there's references still to the blocks and then if there are no references, it will free that block at the heap manager level. So how did Microsoft implement this? Well, they implemented a new function called uh, protected free which is called instead of heap free. 
So kind of understand how this works. What you see on the slide is a flow chart of the steps that are taken by Protected Free and it's actually pretty simple. The first thing it decides to do is whether it's going to do a reclamation sweep or not. And then after that it adds that block to the wait list. It will perform a reclamation sweep if the wait list contains more than 100,000 bytes worth of new blocks on the wait list since the last reclamation sweep. Another key point about protected free is to understand is when protected free is called on an object, it's guaranteed that that object will not be reclaimed in that, in that running of protected free, but it will be added to the wait list. And so these two things, the decision on whether to do a reclamation sweep and the fact that the, the block is added to the wait list at the end of protected free, we can be used to generate a, 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 an attack. So how does the reclamation process work? Well, it traverses every entry on the wait list to determine if it's still being referenced. So here we have an entry referring to a heap, a block on the heap, and the first thing it does is check to see if there's a reference on the stack to this block. Then it checks at the process registers to see if there's a re reference to this block in the registers. If there is a reference, the block will be waitlisted and continue to be waitlisted after protected free is complete. But if there are no references, it will free the block at the heap manager level. So for use after free vulnerabilities where there is a reference on the stack or in the processor registers, memory protection is highly effective against those use after frees. But there are cases where, uh, where references do not exist to the objects. And so what kind of challenges does memory protection present to the attacker? Well, first, there's a deallocation delay due to the reclamation process that occurs. Then there's non-determinism in that reclamation process due to what we call stack junk. And stack junk to us is, is basically non-pointers or stale pointers that are left over on the stack in buffers that have not been cleared of their former contents. So as the reclamation process occurs, it will, it will think that these are pointers into the block and as a result they will not free those blocks. There's also complexity in determining the deallocation time due to the large number of blocks that could be on the wait list. And there's also complexity in the heap manager behavior due to the reordering of the wait list that occurs, making it harder, predict, harder to predict the order in which the deallocations are going to occur. So what kind of attack techniques can we come up with to defeat all of those challenges for the cases of use after freeze where the references don't exist? Well, first you can use uh, generic memory pressuring techniques like this when you see on the screen that will make sure that there are over 100,000 bytes of new blocks on the wait list. Uh, so that the reclamation sweep can be performed the next time protected free occurs, but it doesn't really solve all the challenges. So we're going to take a more surgical approach uh, at, at trying to make sure that a, a use after free that we want to use is deallocated when we want it to be deallocated and overcome all of the challenges that exist due to memory protection. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to prep the wait list to ensure that the next time the reclamation process occurs, um, it will occur when protected free uh, it runs. So what we're going to do is we're going to find a way to allocate a 100,000 byte block and then we're going to free that block using protected free and as we know protected free will only, will add the block to the wait list after it's done, we result in a, in the wait list here having block A on it. So at this time, the next time protected free is called, the reclamation process will occur. So now we're going to prep the wait list and try to bring it to a known size so that we know exactly when deallocations are going to occur. So we're going to force a reclamation sweep and bring that wait list into that approximate size. So first we're going to allocate a block of an arbitrary size, we'll call it B. Then we're going to call protected free on that object. And because we've, we're at the point where the reclamation process will, it, it, the, the code will trigger the reclamation process, it will free block A and free any other blocks that don't have references on there. And after that, it will add block B to the wait list. So at this time, we have a wait list in an approximate size and an approximate known state, clearing everything out. Next, we're going to launch our attack against, uh, and in this case, we're going to call it block C, which is the block that we want to use in the use after free attack. First we're going to add block, block C to the wait list by calling protected free on it. So at this point block C is on the wait list. Then we're going to allocate a block of 100,000 bytes. We'll call this block D and we're going to call protected free on that block which will add the block to the wait list. Then we're going to force reclamation of block C and D by allocating another block. 
and calling protected free on it. And at this point, we've, we've hit the reclamation threshold, which will free block C and block D. And, and now we can move on and use the isolated heap attack techniques to go to try to uh, reclaim the appropriate offsets that we need to continue on uh, exploiting this use after free vulnerability. So, what do we need? Well, we need a way of arbitrarily allocating and deallocating using protected free an arbitrary size block. So we can't use sysalloc string or sysfree string based strings because they don't call protected free when they're destroyed. In this case, we need to use cster, and cster will call protected free. And the way we get to cster is we call get elements by class name. Get elements by class name has a side effect of, of both allocating a block and deallocating a block in the same code the same method. So it gives us an excellent opportunity to do some real surgical stuff with the, with the wait list and, and deallocating uh, blocks on the heap. And so the code that we have here uh, kind of shows how we would use this get elements by class name. First we need to do a little priming procedure, uh, which you see on the first two lines, which we explain in detail on the paper. And then after that, every time we call get elements by class name, it will allocate a cster and then call protected free on that, on that arbitrarily sized object. So we can manipulate the wait list and the heap. Um, what we're going to show you here is a demo video of a use after free vulnerability um, that, we, that we had that uh, we use the techniques that we just talked about with memory protection along with the isolated heap uh, uh, techniques to gain control of the EIP register and clearing up all the challenges that exist, existed from memory protection. So you see here, at this point we, we own the EIP register. You can kind of see right there 41, 41, 41, 41 uh, in, the red, in, in, the, in the good register. So now we're going to turn it over to Simon and he's going to go over how we use memory protection to break ASLR. In this section, we're going to talk about how we were able to abuse memory protection to get a bypass of ASLR. After I got comfortable with making precision modifications to the memory protection state, um, I went back and started thinking some more about uh, something I'd read uh, um, in a blog from Fortinet back in July of 2014. It's a paraphrase from that post. Um, back in 2013, um, Dion showed how conservative garbage collectors uh, used by script engines um, can be attacked to leak information about heap addresses. Um, does memory protection provide a new attack surface for a similar attack? Um, so that's an interesting idea. In a sense, memory protection acts like a conservative garbage collector, uh, freeing allocated memory only if no references are found on the stack. Uh, that means that it might be susceptible to an attack similar to the garbage collection attack done by Dion. Uh, the key idea here is that when memory protection examines values on the stack, it doesn't understand anything about the semantics of those values. It treats each D word as if it is potentially a pointer. So if we like, we can plant a chosen integer value on the stack and memory protection will interpret it as a pointer. Memory protection will then exhibit different behavior depending on whether or not the integer we chose corresponds to an address of waitlisted memory. Uh, so uh, here we see a block on the waitlist. Uh, let's say we plant an integer value on the stack and then trigger memory protection's reclamation routine. Uh, if the integer we planted corresponds to an address anywhere within the block, then memory protection will respond in one way by uh, keeping the block on the waitlist. But if the integer we planted is not within the waitlisted block's address range, then memory protection will behave in a different way and deallocate the block. So it's starting to sound like we may have a way to reveal information about the layout of the address space. We can repeatedly guess an address, plant it as an integer on the stack, and get memory protection to behave in a way that reveals whether or not we have correctly guessed the address of a certain allocated block in memory. In other words, we have an oracle. Or do we? Because at this point, there is still a very big problem. Let's look at the programmatic contract uh, exposed by memory protection. 
Hmm. So aside from that DLL notification, which is not something that gets called during normal program operation, memory protection does not return even a single piece of data from any of its methods. That's a problem. We can influence memory protection based on um, whether we've guessed a correct address or not, but to have an oracle, we need to have the ability to read some kind of a response back. And memory protection's API gives us absolutely nothing. What this means is that we need a side channel. So when I was thinking about this, the first thing that came to mind was that maybe we could use a timing attack. But then something else came along. It was in the summer of 2014 and uh, some cases starting, started coming into uh, the zero day initiative that were kind of unusual. We were seeing proof of concept code that would expose bad code paths in IE by subjecting the browser to memory pressure. Um, the code would do some lengthy loop performing repeated DOM manipulations and also consuming memory. At some point when virtual address space was nearly exhausted and memory allocations were starting to fail, a code path would be triggered that was vulnerable. It was striking how a reasonably reliable trigger could be constructed in this way even though the browser was under such a high level of stress. I started thinking about the idea of operating the browser in a regime of high memory pressure. It's relatively unexplored territory. What kinds of things can we make happen? It struck me as interesting. Something else I noticed was that when a um, script requests an operation that requires a heap allocation and the allocation fails due to a lack of available memory, the script receives an out of memory exception. Here we have a way for attacker's script to detect whether an allocation was a success or a failure. All it needs to do is check for the exception. And here's the crucial insight. Script can detect whether an allocation succeeds or fails. And whether it succeeds or fails is a function of the existing state of the heap. In other words, JavaScript out of memory exceptions are a side channel that reveals information about the state of the heap. And that's exactly the side channel that we need in order to get information back for memory protection. Here's the high level view of how we're going to consult the memory protection oracle. Don't be concerned about the exact details. I'm going to fill those in just a little bit later. For now, let's just appreciate the high level structure of what we're going to do. Say we have a block of memory on the memory protection wait list and we want to consult the oracle um, to determine whether a certain address X is an address that falls within that block. Um, we plant X on the stack as an integer and then we do something that triggers memory protection's reclamation routine. In response, memory protection modifies the heap in a way that's dependent on whether X points within the targeted block. How do we find out how memory protection has responded? We attempt a new heap allocation that is designed to succeed or fail depending upon what memory protection has done to the heap. Then by checking for the presence or absence of an out of memory exception, we can make a deduction about how memory protection has behaved and this reveals the, inf the answer to whether X falls within the targeted block of memory. Here's the whole chain of deductions we make. The presence or absence of an out of memory exception tells us something about the state of the heap. The state of the heap tells us something about how memory protection has behaved and how memory protection has behaved um, tells us whether X falls within the targeted block. That's the high level view. Clearly to actualize all this, it's going to take some pretty careful setup. But here's the thing, going back to something I'd mentioned earlier, once you start thinking about what you can do in a regime of high memory pressure, some really interesting possibilities open up. Um, before going any further though, I'd like to refine what we mean by high memory pressure. It's more subtle than just piling on lots of pressure until there's no free memory left. Um, first of all, it's not really availability of, availability of memory we're talking about, it's availability of address space. 
in a 32-bit process, the limiting factor that causes allocation failures is not memory exhaustion, it's address space exhaustion. The next thing to note, it's possible for allocations to fail even if there's plenty of address space left. It all just depends on how large of an allocation you're asking for. Also, you know, it's not the aggregate amount of remaining address space that matters. It's whether a large enough contiguous free region can be found. So let's refine our idea as follows. Operating the browser in a regime of limited availability of large contiguous regions of free address space. So let's play with this a little bit, see what we can do. Let's say we spray the heap with one megabyte allocations until address space is all consumed. And then we free one of those one megabyte blocks. What's left is a one megabyte hole. And that hole is the one and only contiguous region of one megabyte of free addresses. Uh, we can actually leave lots of smaller holes also and it doesn't change the fact that we have exactly one hole that's one megabyte big. If we now go back and make another one megabyte allocation, um, we know that it will be placed right in that hole because that's the only place it can fit. We can actually keep doing this over and over, allocating one megabyte block and freeing it, allocating a one megabyte block and freeing it. Every time the one megabyte block will be allocated in exactly the same place. Now, what would happen if one time we tried to make that allocation but it failed? What would that tell us? What could make that happen? Well, one thing that could make that happen is if uh, some other allocation came along and occupied the hole. But um, let's say we can rule out that possibility because we know there are no other large allocations going on. Then we might be able to conclude that what happened was the last time around, the one megabyte block never really got freed because memory protection was holding on to it. In other words, we have a way of telling whether memory protection still has the block waitlisted by trying to make a new one megabyte allocation and checking to see if an out of memory exception is thrown. All right, now we have all the main pieces we need in order to make an attack possible. First, we prepare memory, so there's just one large contiguous free region. Let's say one megabyte in size, but it could be any size we like. We're gonna call that the hole or the region. We're going to use memory protection as an oracle to determine where that hole is in memory. We guess an address X and we want to consult the oracle to determine if X falls within the hole. We make a one megabyte allocation, so now the hole is occupied, and then we free the allocation we made, meaning that it gets passed to protected free. Protected free puts the allocation on the wait list as far as the heap manager is concerned, the memory is still allocated. Now we plant X as an integer on the stack. And while X is there on the stack, we do something that triggers memory reclamation. What happens next depends on whether X falls within the one megabyte address region or not. If X falls within the address region, then when memory protection performs reclamation, it will keep this allocation on the wait list and it won't free it at the heap manager level. Otherwise, if X doesn't fall within the region, then memory protection will remove this allocation from the wait list and invoke heap free. So it'll be completely free. Uh, this shows the two possible states we can end up in. If X falls within the region, the hole stays occupied. But if X does not fall within the region, then the hole gets opened up again. Last step, to tell which of these two states we just ended up in, all we need to do is to try another one megabyte allocation. If it succeeds, we know that the hole got opened and this means that X wasn't within the region. But if we get an out of memory exception, that then we know that the hole stayed occupied, which tells us that X falls within the region. Now we have an answer from the oracle. And by repeating this process with different values of X, we can use the oracle to find out exactly where that one megabyte hole is in memory. So I'm going to go back to this idea just one more time. When we operate the browser in a regime of limited availability of large contiguous regions of free address space, the, the new possibilities that arise can be quite interesting. It leads us to what we can do next. 
So far what we have is a way to prepare the address space so that there is just one large hole of available addresses of a size of our choosing and then to use the memory protection oracle to determine the exact addresses of that hole. How can we make good use of this ability? What can an, an attacker gain from knowing the address of a hole in the address space? We can load a module into it. We can start by creating a hole that's exactly the right size for loading a particular module. Then, using the memory protection oracle, we leak the address of the hole. Finally, we cause the loading of the module. It gets loaded exactly at the beginning of the hole because that's exact, that's the only available place in the address space where that module is going to fit. So it's actually an ASLR bypass and it runs quite efficient, efficiently and reliably. We're going to show a demo video here what it looks like. Running the page. Yeah, it's got an address already. Opening up WinDebug, check that address. In this ASLR bypass, we've relied on exhaustion of the 32-bit address space. There's been a, a great deal of confusion about how this affects 64-bit systems. On this slide, we're just going to dispel some myths. Um, the truth is this issue affects every default desktop of IE that's out there except for Metro. I'm not sure about IE 10. Um, this is because under default settings, uh, uh, Windows 10, I should say, not IE 10. I'm not sure about Windows 10. Um, this is because under default settings, classic desktop IE uh, uses a 32-bit renderer process even if the broker process is 64-bit. So even if you've got a 64-bit processor and 64-bit Windows and you're running 64-bit IE with default settings, this ASLR bypass still works. Um, so this has been a lot of fun. Um, what started out looking like it was something that was non-exploitable turned out in the end to be a reliable ASLR bypass. The key insight that made it possible is that JavaScript out of memory exceptions are a side channel that reveals critical information about the state of the heap. I don't think this has been recognized before and there are interesting possibilities that open up when you operate the browser under memory pressure. We've made several recommendations to Microsoft for ways they can improve isolated heap and memory protection to harden them against the attacks we've discovered. Uh, in regard to memory protection, we make the recommendation to remove memory protection from array and buffer allocations. This means that memory protection would apply only to scalar allocations. Our rationale is that one almost never finds an exploitable UAF condition in Internet Explorer where the freed object is an array or a buffer. So the, the benefit of applying memory protection to these types is doubtful. Uh, on the other hand, we've demonstrated how it can be a, a very significant benefit to an attacker. We therefore feel that memory protection will be a stronger defense if applied to scalar allocations only. Our next suggestion pertains to strengthening ASLR. Uh, taking a look at how we got ASLR to fail, what you can notice is that the attacker was able to violate one of ASLR's assumptions by preparing the address space in a particular way. Uh, here's the particular assumption that ASLR makes that when it chooses a load address for a module from among the set of possible load addresses that this random choice will exhibit a significant amount of entropy. But an attacker can break this assumption by radically narrowing the set of possible load addresses before the module loads. Our recommendation is to enhance ASLR by adding an additional check before loading a module. This check is to ensure that there really do exist a multiplicity of addresses 
at which the requested module could load before actually performing the random selection of a load address. If the number of possible load addresses is below, is below a certain threshold, the module load should fail since loading the module under this circumstance could significantly weaken the security of the process. This next recommendation is in regard to out of memory exceptions. We've shown that JavaScript out of memory exceptions are a side channel that reveals information about the state of the heap. Although this leaked bit of information might seem insignificant at first, we have shown that how, how it can actually be leveraged to great effect. Uh, it should also be mentioned that out of memory exceptions are very useful in, to the attacker in setting up conditions of memory pressure that are needed for our ASLR bypass attack as well as triggering various other vulnerabilities that are dependent on memory pressure. We therefore recommend considering eliminating out of memory exceptions in script. When an allocation fails due to memory or address space exhaustion, instead of passing an exception up to script code where it can be handled, the condition should be considered as fatal to the process or at least fatal to script execution within the process. This seems unlikely to have a significant negative uh, impact upon legitimate web pages. Finally, we recommend taking ISO heap to the next logical step by creating additional separate heaps. Ideally, one could have a separate heap for each scalar type. This would bring two great benefits. First, a UAF condition could never lead to type confusion since every type is confined to its own heap. Secondly, since each heap consists entirely of objects of homogeneous size, misalignments will not arise. Actually, this last point is made trickier by the storage of C++ arrays. C++ array storage has a metadata footprint that differs from the storage of individual scalars, so it's possible to use C++ arrays to introduce misalignment. However, as we've mentioned, ex exploitable UAFs in arrays and buffer allocations are extremely rare. So we recommend just leaving all array and buffer allocations on the default heap instead, and if we do that, it should become impossible for an attacker to produce misalignments on the isolated heaps. Actually, there's another completely separate reason why it's best to leave arrays and buffers on the main process heap, and I'd like to digress a moment to explain why. Uh, there's something that doesn't get much attention when ISO heap is discussed, and that's what um, could be called an address reuse attack. What's that? Well, consider how ISO heap is supposed to ensure that when a DOM object is freed, that an attacker won't be able to uh, allocate some other non-DOM type object in its place, such as a string. ISO heap tries to ensure this by making sure that DOM allocations and string allocations don't happen on the same heap. But here's the thing, the attacker doesn't care about heaps. The attacker only cares about addresses. Is it possible for the address of a freed DOM object to later on be the address of a string allocation? This would become possible if the ISO heap, which is the heap on which DOM objects are stored, sometimes relinquishes control of virtual address space it no longer needs. This would create the opportunity for those same addresses to later become part of a different heap, such as the process heap. Then a string could be allocated there. Is this attack actually possible? Currently, this attack is not possible, and here's why. The way the Windows Heap Manager works, small allocations reside within regions of virtual memory called heap segments. And once a particular heap reserves a segment, it never relinquishes control of those virtual addresses. For as long as that heap lives, it will never allow those addresses to become part of any other heap. And today, the ISO heap is used only for small scalar allocations. But if instead IE tried to protect large buffer allocations by placing them on ISO heap, then isolation wouldn't be guaranteed. For large allocations, the heap manager doesn't use heap segments. When the heap manager freed the buffer, it would relinquish control over the actual virtual addresses involved, and later on those virtual addresses could be pu become part of a different heap, breaking the isolation. What this means for us is that it's pointless to try to protect buffers and arrays by placing them on an isolated heap. That isolation could easily be broken uh, by an address reuse attack. Bottom line is, the best way is to keep array and buffer allocations on the default heap and have a separate isolated heap for every type of scalar allocation. 
then those isolated heaps will be completely immune to type confusion and misalignment issues. So having a separate heap for every scalar type is highly beneficial, but the drawback is that it may be too wasteful of address space in a 32-bit process where address space is a scarce resource. We're faced with a trade-off between security and address space usage. What can we do to make the best of this trade-off? We're only going to be able to create a limited number of heaps, and in whatever way we make assignments of types to heaps, an attacker who has discovered a UAF on a given heap will try to construct an exploit via type confusion and or misalignment by making use of the various types we have assigned to that same heap. Unless we randomize the assignments between types and heaps. We can break the monoculture of heap partitioning and instead choose a random partitioning at process startup time. Uh, at process startup time. This denies to the attacker the ability to write a reliable exploit that relies on knowledge of which types are co-located on a heap. Um, this optimizes the defender's advantage when we make the trade-off between security and the number of heaps we're willing to create. All right, so in conclusion, we wanted to also show uh, the exploit that we had generated for the um, bypass program. It was one of the requirements. But what we're gonna, you're gonna see is all of the attack techniques put into one exploit. The first thing you're gonna see is we're gonna launch Internet Explorer and we're gonna use the ASLR bypass to, to break, um, or using memory protection to break uh, ASLR. So you just, at that point, we're just checking to make sure it was the most current browser, which it was. And you'll see it break ASLR, right? Right there, and then it will pass that on the, at the leaked address out, off to the exploit, where it will then use uh, the, the memory protection uh, techniques along with the isolated heap techniques to gain code execution on the latest version of Internet Explorer. Um, so, when we submitted this paper to Microsoft and all of the details and all the recommendations, um, they they awarded it $125,000, and then they uh, sat on it for several months and decided not to implement any of the recommendations uh, that we had talked about. <laughs> so uh, we released all the code. Uh, so it's if you want to go play with the uh, ASLR uh, break and the isolated heap attack techniques and the, and the memory protection techniques, all of the code is out on GitHub. Um, it works on every default uh, version of IE desktop version, as Simon stated. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, we have, uh, for anybody who wants to come up and ask, ask a question, we have a uh, challenge coin up here. Uh, it is, it is a, a ten, it's dual use technology. It's a challenge coin. And it's also a bottle opener. So get it before the Wassenaar takes it away. Uh, thank you. <laughs> have, a, have a nice day.